June 1, 2020. Okay, is there, are there any, any corrections or anything anyone has to add or change? If not, um, I would ask a roll call on the, on the vote. Uh, this is Phil, I say yes. Yeah. Okay. Mary, I say aye. Curtis, aye. Martha must be aye. Um, I didn't hear a second, actually, on Mary's Oh, you're motion. right. Right. Uh, I'll second the motion. This is Phil. I will once again vote aye. 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 Okay, I think we're good. Okay. Five ayes. Okay. Um, Dave, do you have anything, or does anyone have any uh, adjustments to this agenda? Um, Gordon, this is where in the past we have um, accepted the warrants. Okay, we can do that. Okay. Uh, I, I went through them um, earlier today. Uh, anybody any comments about that? Um, I do have a question. What was the on uh, page three of four of accounts payable? The accident at wreck <laughs> for 1100. <laughs> That was 17. my question, too. <laughs> yeah, what was that all about? That was a uh, one employee backing into the other. Oh. Uh, the van backed into uh, John Leonard's uh, car. Uh. Um, and the the uh, deductible was $1,000, so we decided it was like an $1,100 fix, so we yeah. decided just to, to pay directly. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're thank welcome. Another question I had, Dave, was about the uh, Stetzel, Page, and Fletcher. What matter was that for? Uh, that is mostly from um, legal activity relating to a um, uh, a, a court um, to a what's the word I'm looking? I want to say grievance, but towards a, an appeal on a tax assessment. The one that was dropped last meeting? Yep. Okay. And that's actually two invoices combined into one. Awesome. Davis, Phil, just to clarify the um, 48,000 and change um, for Pike Industry is the Quichi Road picking? <clears throat> yes. The 48,000, you said? 48,000, yeah. Yep. So will it be possible at some point in time, once we have all the invoices in, to get a summary, a total on the paving for that project? So that's the total. Oh, that's the entire total for that half a mile is 48,000. Yep, the so estimate was about 50,000, so it came in just a, a little bit under the 50 grand. Okay, so that, I just, just as a small note, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Phil or Gordon, but I think that's pretty substantially under the roads plan estimate per mile for paving. Is that right? Uh, it's under the estimate for uh, for reclaiming the whole road. This was not reclaiming, taking up the asphalt. This is just a layer on top. Okay. 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 Well, um, if there's nothing else, um, I entertain a motion for accepting the warrants as presented. Mary wants to do it, but we can't hear her. I'm on mute. I'm on mute. I make a motion that we accept the um, accounts payable warrants as presented. Curtis okay. will second it. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Phil, aye. Mary, aye. Martha, aye. Gordon, aye. Okay, very good. So now, now we're gonna take a few minutes, like five minutes or so for any public comments that anyone wants to bring up. And bear in mind here that we've got an hour set aside for the intersection discussion, at which time we can allow some public comment also. So 
maybe these comments could be something other than intersection comments. Gordon, can I ask a question sure. about that agenda item actually? Sure. Will we also be talking about the proposal that I sent around earlier today at that time? We can do that. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So then it might be it might be important to note that during the discussion of the intersection, we will also talk about a establishing forums whereby people can submit questions about the three corners intersection right. project. Yes. Um, so we're hoping to be able to create a centralized repository. So but we'll get to that later at that time. I guess. That's right. Very good. Uh, so, I have a question. Um, they, T Transit scheduled to pave Route 5 from Windsor to Hartford last year, or it was supposed to start in April. I was wondering whether you have any update from them as to whether they're still proposing to do that or whether that's been postponed temporarily or permanently. Uh, I believe they're going to be paving that. Um, uh, I think they're going to be starting next week or the week after. And no, that project, that project's still a go. They just painted the white line for that Route 5, so it seems like a waste. <laughs> Thank you. John, they're going to repave, repave around those white lines. So oh. they, <laughs> That'll be tricky. Any other public comments? Well, why don't we move along then? So Dave, we got next thing is uh, on the old business is the um, update on the COVID situation. Any discussion you have or new information? Uh, a little bit. Um, I would just like to remind everybody that we do indeed still have um, COVID-19 around. Uh, we're still in a uh, pandemic out there, so we still are acting as such, at least internally here. Um, even though it's easy to forget as the headlines seem to indicate things opening as we go here, people out eating, et cetera. But um, we are still, um, if you follow the details, um, following the guidance and um, just want to remind everybody it's still there. Uh, that being said, last week they did loosen some of the restrictions uh, on recreation, uh, allowing for some team activities, um, you know, mainly more of a non-contact sport, such as soccer, lacrosse, baseball. Uh, therefore, we will be uh, adding to the summer camp program. We'll be offering a baseball clinic. We will also be offering the race at basketball camp. Uh, however, we will be doing essentially drills with the camp. Uh, not necessarily, um, you know, um, competition type games. Uh, again, unless that changes between now and the end of July. Um, again, summer camp is scheduled for June 22nd. And at the last time I spoke to John, it was full. Um, we did have a maximum capacity of 20 kids due to what we could and couldn't do. And at this point, it is full. Uh, John also did receive a $4,400 grant. I, I don't believe that's part of your financial uh, information uh, for the end of May, but um, I believe that did come in in June, and that's essentially uh, money to go towards, um, you know, COVID-19 related activity um, or, or precautions, uh, which we do have and have started expending for such things as face masks, thermometers, rubber gloves. Um, we need to utilize a pair of rubber gloves um, per individual uh, student or child that comes in. So we're going to go through at least 20 gloves a day. Um, so we had to stock up on that. Um, so that grant will come in useful and um, there's relatively few strings attached to that. Damon Hall, we're continuing to operate um, essentially as we have been, about two to three people um, per, per, per time. And also, I did put in your packets the legislation. Uh, there is legislation that I believe has been passed that would allow the towns to 
uh, change the date that you have tax collections or um, you know, ease the penalties or interest if so desired. We talked a little bit about that in the past. Um, traditionally, you need voter approval to change the date that you have collections. They've relaxed that. Um, just know that that's hanging out, essentially, hanging out there, uh, essentially. Really kind of it, Gordon. Okay. Hey, Dave. Um, Gordon, is it all right if I go ahead? Yes. Uh, I I agreed with your opinion on that about uh, no need to change it right now. Yeah, and actually, I would, as per the last discussion, I would really um, recommend we stay consistent and you know keep those dates the same, just based upon some of the issues and, and practices we've had in the past. I think just keeping it um, consistent will alleviate any further issues with that. Yeah. The way I read that, it's it's going to uh, sunset at the end of the year anyway. And yeah. also, we would still be, the town would still be on the hook for the deadline for school taxes anyway, so that's yes. not possible. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I will say that we're, from all the people I've I've spoken with, social services, um, talking about their the needs that they've had, there hasn't been a big uptick um, either at the beginning of the crisis or currently, there still isn't one. So we're keeping our tabs on that through the food shelf and mutual aid and all of that stuff. So if it starts to look like the people in Heartland are getting hit really hard by this economically, then we'll know pretty rapidly, I guess. So. Mm -hmm. Hey, this is Phil. Um, I, my question really was uh, about the white education property tax, because as I read this, they, de they decouple it from the municipal property tax. So do we have to have a mutual decision with the school board? <coughs> I I don't believe they decouple it. Um, we're responsible for um, putting out the billing and the collection on the school tax, uh, and they want us to pay that, as, as Curtis pointed out, pay that school tax on time. The municipality always gets the short end of the stick. You know, mm -hmm. if we have delinquencies, school, st school still gets their money, we come up short. Um, so, if I understand it right, um, they it's the process is still the same. If anything, they've streamlined it, not streamlined it, but kept it the same. And, and the dates that we have to pay that school money that you know was due to them uh, is set. Um, so, the, yeah. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. And we're still waiting to see if the state will get us the school tax rate on time. Um, we had gotten notice that it may be as late as August 1st. It generally comes out July 1st, and then we set our school and, and town tax rate mid to third week in July, and it goes out um, at the end of July, early August. And we had been receiving some information that they may be as late as um, August 1st, almost kind of an at best estimate. Although Martin was telling me today that he heard that uh, they were uh, at this point, they were hoping to get a July 1st tax rate out there. So, um, yeah, we're we don't win either way. <laughs> You know, they, they send us the tax rate when they want, yet we still have to pay when, you know, dates are set. So um, I'll just leave it at that. Well, Dave, what's the, what's the deal about that they can't do it um, when they're on time? What, what are the obstacles? Uh, I believe one of the bigger obstacles is um, the July 15th um, new deadline for taxes. Uh, and um, the prebate plays a big portion of this, and um, they kind of uh, that's going to hinder their ability to calculate uh, several things um, mm -hmm. pertaining to this. That's one of the items. Mm -hmm. uh, revenues. The other big one is obviously the education fund is um, 
funded by other mechanisms other than just the property tax. I yeah. believe that the uh, sales tax on the rooms and meals is part of that. And that's really been deficient. So I don't think they really have an idea as to what the total amount in that pot is going to be, uh -huh. um, you know, until the year runs out. So I think they're kind of struggling coming up with, you know, there's been a real debate as to who's going to make up that deficiency, who's going to make up that shortfall in the education fund if what the, the state puts into it to, to make that whole is short whether it's going to be the towns, the state, you know, who's going to borrow for it. Um, so I don't, I kind of lost track in the last week to 10 days on that discussion. I don't think it's been solved, but I know that all of that combined is creating an issue for them as to what they need to raise for the property, uh, for the school tax rate combined with, you know, the various budgets. And I think there's still, I think maybe a couple have had it, but the last I knew it was like 16 towns that still had an unsettled budget that hadn't been voted on due to the virus. Um, so they still needed to kind of factor that in. Uh, so there's a bunch of issues that are kind of, you know, not giving them a clear set of numbers to work with as far as what they need to come up with. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, Dave, would this be a good time to just have a, a quick discussion on the uh, tax sale issue or in the taxes I know it's in your minute in your manager's notes um I guess you just have to remind me where we are on the agenda I'm not sure I think we've kind of wandered off a little bit I'm not well, sure it's we're, on we're, the agenda so we we're in we're in the very first side in COVID but we, we got from that into taxes because of um, people having a hard time to pay uh, um, potentially. Um, so that was on a um, future agenda item. Yeah. Um, based upon, I have, you know, due to the work in, effort into the three corners intersection vote, um, I have not started that process. But based upon some conversations that we have had um, at the select board level in circumstances like this, um, I was under the belief that. Um, this is something that we still wanted to move forward and do. Um, so it was my intent that um, that was something that we were um, going to start the process on. Uh, it hasn't started, but I think that um, my opinion is, is that everybody on that list is either a repeat customer or um, had issues way before this started. I'm not sure that this has <coughs> worsened or bettered their situation, but um, I don't see a benefit to prolonging it with the individuals that we have on the, their list would be my would be my feedback. OK. We, right, so. we, we do get we do get to a point where the select board needs to approve via motion to move forward with a tax sale and, and yeah. um, that would be coming up. Uh, if not at the July 6th meeting, probably the July, I don't know what the date is after that, the 16th or 17th, somewhere in there, um, it would need right. to be at one of those meetings. So we can deal with it more formally at that point. Okay. All right, well then let's move along down the agenda to um, talk about the budget, just the budget update that you have on here. And find my papers. So I was hoping you were going to put that one off until after the hour-long discussion because I didn't we can do that. I had put a whole lot of into it, but um, I can I can go over that. Let's do it, and then we'll um, we'll dedicate the entire time to the three quarters intersection. Okay. Um, I won't get too into it, um, other than it looks. Um, much like I have said the last um, month or two, I'll stick with the general fund. Uh, again, we uh, it's in my town manager update. We're probably about $189,000 delinquency at this point. Just something to keep in the back of your head. Uh, but other than that, um, revenues uh, on paper have come in greater than expected. 
Uh, I am backing out of that the sale of the 21 house. If you look at the sale of the 21 house, it puts us um, over, you know, by $166,000. Uh, of course, on the expense side, when we turn around and take off the loan on that, um, I also took it off the expenses so that we're looking apples to apples. Um, just so that you know, otherwise we're even better than um, uh, even better than that um, by me taking that out. Um, it's not on here, but what I have stated the last month or two, and uh, Curtis uh, asked specifically where I thought the revenue deficiency would come from due to the virus, and I mentioned the rec center and the loss of the summer camp revenue. We won't get the full revenue that we would have been expecting, um, but I do believe, you know, with the 20 kids, um, we'll close that gap in the month of June, which is um, a positive. Plus we'll have the grant revenue coming in as well. Um, so that kind of evens the rec center out a little bit. On the expense side, uh, things are looking pretty good. What is not in here and a good chance, and we've been talking about this, that will it will end up going into fiscal year 21 is the front steps to the, to the rec center in Damon Hall, which is expected to start at the end of June, um, possibly early July, but hopefully the end of June. Uh, you know, that's a, um, a good expense that if it's not in this year's budget, um, you know, is will be money not spent. So that is helping this budget along, which also um, is why it is also looking pretty good. Uh, we do have money in there to deal with it next uh, fiscal year, but just know that that is one of the differentials in the expense side. Um, we should be roughly 92% expense. Uh, at the moment, we're about 87% expensed with about 100% of revenue coming in. Um, again, we'll see some activity in June. Um, this is through May. So that's the general fund. Uh, can can you answer a statutory question for me real quick? Yep. Um, how do we do budget? How do we hold over budget from year to year? What's allowed for that? So like Damon Hall, we had a line item for the Damon Hall stairs. We don't use it now and we want to use it in a month or whatever after the budget is done. How does that work? Um, it really, it technically, uh, it goes away um, almost until we do an audit and then we determine. So at the end of the year, come June 30th, the year closes, okay? We either have a surplus or we have a deficit. Um, and really it almost takes, you know, we truly don't close the books until the end of August uh, with the, the governmental accounting. Uh, and that's when we true up the um, delinquent um taxes it becomes deferred revenue and there's some other other adjustments that are made uh, at that point again it's either a surplus or a deficit and that essentially goes to the balance sheet um, if we were a company it would go to equity where a governmental entity it goes to fund balance uh, and then it becomes either a positive or a negative fund balance we have hovered literally between a deficit and um, a surplus, depending on where our delinquent taxes fall. So for us, the decision isn't all that complicated. We usually kind of hang tight and see where we land. Um, we may very well swing to a deficit because I don't see a tax sale occurring before Labor Day, before that end of the August you know, cutoff date. So our ability to, you know, we had a tax sale in August last year. So we really closed that gap and brought in a lot of that deferred revenue. And we kind of swung to a surplus. We may again indeed swing to a deficit, small one. If that's the case, we'll probably work with it um, because it's not all that, you know, it kind of swings back and forth and we'll go into next year, um, you know, when we budgeted for expenses. If we have a surplus and it's a, large enough surplus or a continuous surplus, you essentially need to go back to the voters and say, you know, okay, what do you want to do with the surplus? You can put it in reserve account. You can pay down, you know, next year's tax rate. 
you know, there's various things that you can do with it, but at the moment we're not we're not there. So I think my my more specifically my question would be, given that you've signed a contract for the Damon Hall steps, but we don't anticipate that contract being executed until the close of the fiscal year, how can we pay that out given that that wasn't a line item in the budget that was voted on for this year? Well, I actually we we uh, we have a capital uh, expense or a capital um, number of about 60,000. You know, we've got other things in the pipeline that um, I would like to address. Um, you know, we may have to push that off due to the fact that we're now looking at next year's budget to, um, you know, work within that, you know, do that in. You know, it, we're going to get into the weeds here a little bit. Um, you know, if was to say all things were zero, you know, everything was working as it should. Um, the budget ended exactly as we dictated. Um, and the only difference was is that we had a $35,000 surplus because we didn't do the stairs. You could essentially deficit spend the following year and eat up that fund balance or equity. Um, you know, it's kind of there, but um, you know, again, once you get to a large enough surplus, you should really go to the voters and, you know, ask them if that's what they'd like to do. Okay. Um, you know, at the moment, um, you know, I, you know, we, it's tough to tell where we'll end up. We usually wait for the auditor to come in and, and end up with those final audited numbers, which is usually in the late or early winter. Um, but otherwise, we do have money earmarked for capital project expenses, of which this would fall into. Thanks for the question, Phil. I know we don't want to spend too much time on this, but um, two questions on the pilot program. One, one, what is the property that is generating the funds from the pilot program? And second, there's a jump of $20,000 there, which is great. Um, yep, we talked about this last meeting. Uh, the pilot money is essentially from the North Heartland Dam. Uh, they are on kind of a contract. Um, you know, it's not your typical property tax uh, revenue. Um, it got put under the pilot. You know, pilots generally money from the state for state buildings that are on town property. But, um, you know, this is kind of where this has been. Um, the it's actually, a, it, we, we goofed um, kind of in our favor. You know, we put down 1,500 as a budgeted revenue number. It was intended to be 15,000. We get that and I tend to budget conservatively. We come up with that $15,000 number uh, simply because by contract, the minimum number or amount that we can expect from the North Heartland Dam is 15,000. Um, we have received as little as, you know, the low 20s. Um, we've received as high as in the 40s. Um, it's difficult to know what that number is going to be. It's, you know, kind of dependent on what they generate. It's kind of a complex formula. Um, so without knowing a definitive number rather than, you know, guessing like 30, we go conserve and say, okay, we know we won't get anything less than 15,000. So we budget 15,000. Thank you. Yep. And Dave, this is relatively small, and I feel like we may have gone over it, so maybe just refresh my memory. Um, the water bills for the rec center and the activity center, um, why are they 215% each? Because uh, we, there's a new fangled testing um, that the state has come up with. Uh, I think it's for the PCO, I'm going to get it wrong, PCO, PC, PSOAs or something to that effect. They came out with a new fangled um, thing that um, we now test both of the daycares for, uh, including the rec center. Um, so that is a rather expensive test. Um, Mike, I um, can't remember Mike's last name at the moment, over at the school does the testing for us, um, which is nice, but the, the test for these particular things that um, came down the pike is, is 
It's actually kind of pricey. Okay. Uh, highway, I'll just get into quick. Um, highway is kind of uh, a little bit more difficult to pinpoint uh, because we have had such you know, grant and FEMA activity the last two years. Uh, as you can see, we've had revenue come in 30, 44, almost 70 grand in, in grants. Some of that, or a lot of that, pertains to last fiscal year. Um, we had by design uh, built into this budget to utilize $45,000 in surplus to offset expenses. I don't believe we're gonna need to use that. Um, actually, I know we won't need to use that. And even with the $50,000 um, Queechy Road expense that we were really planning on doing next fiscal year, uh, we're still showing, I would say a $50,000 um, surplus um, or just that we have underexpensed. So, you know, the, the whole plan was, is we kind of overexpensed last year uh, because we did paving um, County Road um, essentially two years worth in May simply because they were available and ready to go. And we were going to kind of hold off this year and then do it next year. And that was going to kind of even things out and build the surplus and the highway fund back up. But we did Queechy Road, um, they were available, we did it. So it throws a little bit of a monkey wrench into that, but it's really at the end of next June 30th, it should, we should still end up in the same place. Um, so I think that that is, you know, the highway funds or highway department or highway fund to be specific. Um, also is looking um, as it should, even though we overexpensed on salt and um, a couple other items um, last winter. Any other questions, Dave? I'm good. Oh, that's uh, okay then. Let's call it good. We can study that some more on our own, I guess. Okay, so we'll move on. Um, you want to do, Dave? Are you anxious to do the intersection? Uh, why don't we take care of the uh, new planning commission okay. members? Okay. Of which you have three, um, John Bruno, Kate Donahue, who just entered the meeting, um, if she's still with us, um, and Wes Johnson. Um, Jay, are you with us? thought I might have seen him earlier. I don't see anyone attached to that name. Um, I can... Ballots for Jay in the process, um, but uh, we have two of the three here um, that are wishing to be Planning Commission members. We had um, a couple, we had one opening at the time because the Planning Commission had kind of um, went from a nine to a seven member commission, just based upon the fact that they weren't getting people interested. We put it out a couple of times on the listserv and word of mouth that we were looking for a planning commission member. Um, four actually responded. Um, one got picked up by the Dave, we can't understand what you're saying. Dave, we lost your voice. Reset the router. Now Comcast is doing work. How about now? Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you Sort of. Can you hear me in now? In and out. Can you hear me? In and out. Well, that's something new. 
Uh, yeah. How about now? Well, you, the screen is frozen too, Dave. Can't hear you at all. Well, what well, I, can, I can pick up or Phil can pick up from the actual meeting. Um, so they had, they were down to seven member commission and they had one opening and then they heard from all three of the people who had applied to be on the planning commission and they were actually really excited about all of them and were happy to expand the commission out and get some new ideas and some uh, fresh blood into the commission as it were. And so I um, think that according to the memo that we got, um, all three of them, Wes Johnson, Kate Donahue, and John Bruno have agreed to serve on the commission and they have been uh, voted on to the commission by its, its current membership. That sounded good, Curtis. <laughs> now we can, now everything's better, Dave. How's that? Yeah. I plugged in direct. So let me just get my chair and my notes. <laughs> Gordon, I was wondering if Kate or John wanted to say anything. Yeah, it's a good idea. I know, I think they're both here. I don't know about Wes. Kate, are you? Hello, yes. I'm here. Kate Donahue. Hi, can Kate. you hear me? We can see you and hear you. Hi. <laughs> yes, I would be excited to serve on the planning commission if it were voted upon by the select board. I look forward to learning more and also helping to contribute to the town. Sounds good. Hey, thanks, Kate. Uh, John Bruno, um, yeah, I'm happy to serve and uh, offer whatever input or expertise that I have to the planning commission. Thank you, John. I'm excited to have a fellow anthropologist on one of the boards in town. Kate is an anthropologist, so. <laughs> not too many of us. <laughs> there are not too many of us, no, right. And John, I was very intrigued to see your name attached to the year 1993 to 94 for the Three Corners Intersection Project. So, Gordon, do you need a motion? We do, we do. I was wondering if Wes is, Wes is around. Is Wes? I don't see Wes's meeting? name on the, um, on the list. So, Phil, would you like to make that motion? Um, <laughs> sure, I'll make a motion that uh, we accept Wes Johnson, Kate Donahue, and John Bruno as members of the planning commission uh i'm not sure if there are terms involved so uh, um there are terms this word jay would be good um so two would be picked up as a three and there's one um uh, if you hold that thought Uh, Bill, I would just say to their designated terms, and then we can maybe fill in the gap next meeting officially, um, so I can get that information from Jay. Okay. Uh, Martha, I'm not sure where I'm at, so can you add that for... Yes, I have, um, uh, Phil made a motion to accept these three as members of the planning commission. I think we have to say a point. 
Oh, a right? point. Okay. Yeah. Bill um, said the wrong word. Yeah, and terms it's to Bill's be fault. current length of term to be determined. Or, or I know the I know the commission. The commission knew what the terms were. Two, as Dave was saying, two of them are the same term, and then one of them is a shorter term. So maybe as 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 determined or whatever you said, Dave. Yep. I'll fill in the gap for you next meeting. Motion by committee. <laughs> can we have a second? I'll, I'll second. go ahead and second. Mary can. Second. Okay, we've got two seconds. That's good. All in favor? Mary says aye. Curtis says aye. Bill says aye. Martha says aye. Gordon says aye. Okay. Dave, your your picture and your voice are 100% better. Can I, um, as long as we're on commissions, can I ask, did we get um, any communication from the Energy Commission yet, Dave, about their chairpersonship? Rob Sangster has become chair of the Energy Committee. So is that anything that we need to act on as the board? No, I don't think no, so. No, it's, okay. it's, it's in around. OK, cool. Just that thank so thank you very much, Kate and John, for being willing to serve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK, done. All right, we'll move on to the uh, Three corners intersection, favorite subject. <laughs> so I think Dave's probably got a presentation here, especially about the money. Uh, actually, I'm going to go a little bit back into history quite a bit too sure, there, Gordon, uh, leading, up to the, leading up to the budget and um, yeah. more, more specifically to the number that um, you will use for a um, um, a warning for the, the vote in August. But I felt based upon the fact that we have two, you know, Phil was around, but he was not part of the select board, um, you know, due to the fact that we have two select board members that have not been part of this history. Plus due to the, you know, overall interest from the, from the folks in town, I decided just to go back in time a little bit to bring people up to speed as to what did and did not go into the underlying project what we've done since then and how that leads us to where we are today. Um, so I will, the only thing I, I will ask, um, this is um, quite a bit of information. I ask that, uh, you know, we take questions at the end uh, with an exception of the budget part. I think that um, you're, I'm going to, you know, open that up after we talk numbers and um, you know, with that, because I think it'll be, I, I do think it'll need some, some explanation and then I'll finish it off and then we can have some general conversation or questions on that board. Um, that's, that's good. Right to you. Dave, thanks for sending the timeline. Yep. If I can find it. You know, let's hear some more. So that's where I'm going to start. Um, can everybody still hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. So my file, and I understand, I, I read a newspaper article in 1985 uh, that quoted Hiram Allen uh, stating uh, in 1985 that the discussion on this project um, goes back 30 years, which would bring it back to 1955. Uh, I also saw a newspaper article saying that this project goes back to 1973. Uh, my files start in 1975, uh, where the town uh, requested to the straight state. Uh, it's a little unclear exactly what they were requesting, um, but they requested to the district four manager um, uh, to correct the hazardous situation at Heartland Three Corners at the intersection of Route Five and Twelve. Um, they did go. <clears throat> on to say that they were inquiring as to when this project might be scheduled for completion. Uh, if not scheduled at this time, when will it be reviewed by the Transportation Board for scheduling? 
Um, that's because this conversation with the select board in District 4 regarding this particular request dated back to 1975. Um, so there was a three year lapse there um, and the select board was um, inquiring about where the state was. In 1981, uh, the select, uh, the town manager at that point, Ron Hanley, um, requested to the state, again, District 4, asking them to alleviate um, basically traffic in and out of uh, Rouse's Point Plaza, which I believe is now uh, the BG's complex and, and bank. Um, there was, um, it's, it's not quite as configured as it is now. There's people, you know, traffic coming in and out. Um, and at that point, going into 1985, uh, there was a recognition that traffic was coming out of this and then cutting uh, straight across the triangular part of the intersection. So the select board agreed and, and actually the Heartland Planning Commission at this point in time was heavily involved in this discussion. Um, so the Heartland Planning Commission essentially approached the select board and um, Larry, as I go through the 80s and into the 90s, if you have any clearer information, you know, please go ahead. Um, John Bruno, you as well. Um, there was a request, uh, they agreed to put a request to the state to curb or to put guardrails around the triangle um, and essentially seed and grass the triangle to essentially to keep people from cutting across. Uh, and the select board kind of went back and forth on that because there was also a chance to get on the state schedule um, for a redesign with what they call the five-year betterment project. Uh, and at this point in time, um, Representative Welsh, who at that point was Senate pro tem of Vermont, um, was throwing some considerable weight around and got the project onto that list in 1986, um, actually going into 19, uh, in 86, going into 1987. Uh, and I actually have in my drawer just to take out and just make my day, you know, just to kind of, kind of adjust or, or recalibrate. I take it out of my drawer every now and then. The 1986 town report had a direct quote from Hiram Allen stating that this project would be done in the summer of 1987. Um, again, it was on this betterment um, list with the state of Vermont. Uh, the price tag at that point was $55,000. Uh, the state and the town went back and forth. Uh, and then in 1993, a memo pops up um, to actually Matt Dunn, who was a state representative at that point, uh, Matt was asking, uh, I get, uh, or from what I can tell by the files, was kind of asking what happened to the project in the late 80s. Um, that memo basically stated that the town and the state couldn't come together um, on essentially the scope of the, scope of the project, uh, and therefore it was dropped. Um, I don't know too many more specifics than that, other than um, it was on the state list. Um, we couldn't come to terms with it and it kind of faded away. Um, in 1993 and into 1994, again, the Heartland Planning Commission was um, very much a part of this. I believe they had a grant. They worked with John Bruno and John presented five alternatives um, to the intersection um, as we know it today. Uh, I did, um, contact Jay Boweri about this. Um, you know, the drawings um, are in my office. Um, they were also part of the scoping study that I'll get to shortly. Um, but Jay, I got the impression from Jay that it was presented to the select board um, and didn't make it any farther than that, really. Um, it just kind of, uh, again, just kind of died. Uh, and stayed fairly quiet, um, at least in my records, until 2007, uh, when the town um, got involved with the Safe Routes to School project, which is essentially the sidewalk on Station Road around Route 5. Um, that grant 
uh, in making it walkable. I think the um, intent was to be able to walk from the school to the library, um, or at least from the school into the village. Uh, it became apparent at that time with the sidewalk on Station Road and around Route 5 that the ability to cross the intersection from that sidewalk proved difficult. Um, and it was kind of, you know, kind of a red flag. It was kind of discussed. Um, and then in 2011, um, Dana Jacobson Goodhue um, and her husband, but the letter is from her, uh, in 2011, um, wrote to actually John Bartholomew and um, essentially stating um, or describing an incident where they were trying to cross the road. Um, it was the four of them. Um, uh, and uh, the two of them and their two kids, um, the six-year-old or seven-year-old um, was crossing the road and the, I believe it was a car going northbound to south, which would have been on the outside lane, um, came within inches of hitting the girl. Um, and I believe that uh, the family took up that as a cause to also, um, you know, lobby I, I guess the town to make that a safer intersection to cross. But I think that combined with the um, safe routes to school was kind of an impetus to making this a more pedestrian friendly um, crossing. Uh, that leads us into 2013, 2012, actually more 2012. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this because this is important and this is really the impetus of the design today. Um, there was a scoping study. So in 2012, the town went uh, and essentially worked through what today is the bike ped program, which is back involved with this with this project. Uh, they did a scoping project. I think it was about thirty thousand dollars. The town had to pay the twenty percent or maybe the ten percent back then, uh, and came up with a document that outlined or um, shows how they came up with the present design and the process that they did to go through that. Uh, and again, let me just take a moment uh, or a few to kind of go through that because there's a fair amount of decent information in here. And a lot of questions I get, well, they didn't do this or they didn't do that is actually in this document. Um, you know, so this document, 2012, they did a little bit of a background history, existing conditions. Dave, Dave, who is they? Who is the firm? RSG on a White River Junction. Uh, so some of the existing conditions here, uh, again, you didn't have quite the uh, one way that we have today. So you had multiple ins and outs of the plaza there. But you can also see the multiple stop signs and kind of the configuration of the intersection um, and the flow of traffic as to um, what, or, you know, again, kind of a present day condition. They did go through and they did collect um, traffic data. They pulled um, data from the state of Vermont. Um, they also did some crash data history. But um, here's some of the numbers from 2012. Uh, this is from uh, VTRANS. US 5 going south, uh, 4,500, that's per day. Um, Vermont 12 going west, it's 3,100. So those are the, you know, kind of the two main um, corners within this intersection. Uh, they did take a look at that. They did take it into consideration when they came up with their level of service, uh, which is what it's called. They also did go out and they did uh, traffic uh, or turn counts, which is a part of this as well. So they did gather this information. Um, by the way, they did say, um, based upon their analysis, to go through um, the main intersection, which is kind of what resembles a four-way today. Um, and then again, as you come out Route 12 to Route 5, took about 16 seconds to get through both of those intersections. Uh, and they did project out to 2022 when they put these numbers together. 
Uh, and here's again some of the, the level of service information. Um, they also did a kind of a mini um, resource inventory, much like what we're doing today with the categorical exclusion, not nearly as, as sophisticated as what the federal government's going to ask, but they touched on it. Um, and they, you know, based upon mapping and other things, um, looked in, um, you know, deer yards and, and um, wetlands was not a problem. So where they started with this, once they kind of did that um, background review of the intersection, uh, and here are John Bruno's five designs uh, that he came up with in 1993-1994. They actually used this as the backdrop um, as, you know, studying the alternatives to choose from that the public was actually going to choose from. Uh, that's what they started with. And you can see some of the designs that are here that John came up with, one of which was a roundabout, which I think at that time received um, quite a bout of feedback. But uh, they're interesting designs. Um, and you can see kind of where um, concept D is where we start to get the four-way intersection uh, alternative and where that was born from. Again, here are some of the um, distinct um, alternatives that he came up with. Uh, and then before they broke out or had public participation, uh, RSG went back and essentially rated each of those five designs. Um, so again, in that first paragraph in preparation of the local concerns meeting, RSG evaluated each of the concepts, um, alternatives. I guess maybe they narrowed it down to three at one point uh, by developing comparisons to show how the reconfiguration would differ from each other based upon existing conditions. And some of the, the things that they kind of rated them on was open space, the amount of pavement, um, paved <coughs> roadway area, the delay that um, each alternative would um, cause to the reconfiguration. Um, that is, you know, if it was a four-way, how much of a delay would that be at a four-way compared to the present configuration? They took into walking distance uh, from Station Road, um, total stop signs or, or yield signs per alternative, uh, and they kind of rated those. Um, they came up with kind of a rating like that. Uh, we'll come back to that in a little bit, but then they had an actual public participation and public meetings. Actually, several of these um, uh, happened throughout the course of this process. One of these public meetings was at, I believe, the 2013 town meeting of which they covered a lot of this. They actually did a presentation. Uh, and then they chose after that process uh, and the public participation, they showed or chose or came up with the selection of the preferred alternative. Now, um, it doesn't look exactly like the design today, but there was changes made between this and preliminary and, and um, uh, preliminary design. Um, tweaks made, I wasn't part of that, so the select board may have to weigh in on that but um, this is the basis for the decision on the four-way. <sighs> kind of get some conceptuals, whoops. I think Dave just left the meeting. <laughs> on accident. <laughs> um, John, could I ask you a question based on that drawing in a very brief paragraph I just read? Um, so the it showed the modified four-way stop that still had a continuous, it looked like non-stopped service on Route 5. And it said by 
it, the paragraph essentially said by employing this modified four way stop, they would be able to maintain a level of service of quality A in both AM and PM peak hours. Given that the current intersection proposal doesn't have that modification and is just a four way stop, do you have any sense or do you happen to know uh, what the level of service expectation class would be during those peak hours without the modification? Well, without analyzing it, I, I don't know whether they really analyzed it um, with that configuration, but I don't think that it would drop significantly okay. um, with the volumes of traffic that are there. So you think, do you expect we'd still be looking at like a level B and above service or level A and above or C and above or? I, I would think it would probably be B and above, but okay. you'd really have to <clears throat> analyze it to, look, to, to, to figure that out. But the um, the standard for design for VTRANS is to design for at least the C level or above, and I'm sure we you would be there with that. And what, um, if if you can recall, what is the level of service rating for the current configuration? I didn't catch it. I, I didn't, I don't recall, I didn't catch it either. Thanks, John. Yeah. Dave, are you anywhere around? <laughs> Um, could we, if we're waiting on Dave, could we, could I describe the proposal for information or, oh yeah, so Neil just said, given that he started the meeting, he may not be able to get back in. <laughs> uh, thanks, Neil. I wonder if we all have to start over. Um, yeah, I just reached out by text to Dave, but I didn't did not get a response back yet. I, I'm not familiar enough with Microsoft Teams to know if that's true or not, but if he was the organizer, are we now just residue of a meeting and there is no meeting? <laughs> uh, it's still being recorded, though. Yeah, it's still recording. So Neil, do you happen to know how someone could let him in if they weren't the organizer? Dave gets a early Monday night. <laughs> Is there a default person who would get it? Martha, were you the second person uh, allowed in the meeting, right? You might uh, check and see, have you somehow, somehow become the organizer? I was, this, I'm checking to see. Well, I texted him, but I don't know. I'm gonna phone Dave and see what happens. Which number, Gordon, the cell or the land? The, the, the land number. Not all of us have the town manager's cell phone number, Phil Hobby. Uh -oh. Well, I could give it to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> he would hate you so much. Oh. Yeah, Curtis, I, I think we should wait on the proposal of just sure. in the fact that we're in this flow between the. Yeah, the I was just, I was just thinking of a way to fill the time.
Dave, if you're there, would you please pick up? We're trying to figure out what to do next because we've lost you or you or you've lost us. I'm not sure which it is. We'll probably lose half of the audience. That didn't work either. No, no answer. Yeah. And try your cell phone number. Yeah, I, I, I'm beginning to feel that the theory that the, the meetings ended is true. Um, uh, I just got a text. Oh, from here's Dave. Yay. <laughs> oh, is he back? Yeah, I couldn't get him to answer either. I think you're muted, though, Dave. Where did I lose you? Woo! Uh, back in 19, 1978, I think. Uh, or 75, didn't he say 75? No, he was in 90. Actually, I think you you had just gone through the summary of the four alternatives. Um, 2013. The advantages and disadvantages of the four alternatives in the scoping study, I think, is where you were. So in a nutshell, uh, it was a 10 second uh, wait time that they determined by bringing that into a four way intersection. Uh, they had public participation um, both on the November 19th and also um, at town meeting that year. Um, following that, they had the vote on 2014 um, that um, had over 45 minute discussion. Uh, the vote was to raise $450,000. Uh, for the intersection project to be borrowed from the capital project reserve fund um, and to be paid back over a five year period of time. Um, hopefully I won't lose you here. Are you still with me? Yeah. Okay. So since 2014, they've gone into the, um, they had preliminary plans. They then submitted designs to the state of Vermont in 2017. In 2017, the state of Vermont came back and said, there's some deficiencies here. One, uh, we needed to get the easements um, from surrounding property owners. We had two, um, of the easements that we needed. We still needed to get easements from Matt Dunn, who was a new property owner. And we still needed to get easements from Billy Gosher. Um, and that started essentially the, um, uh, a process that we sat down with Matt Dunn. We sat down with Billy Gosher and Mike from Mike's Deli. Uh, we talked about what we were gonna do and what we needed. Um, and some of the <clears throat> feedback that we received from them was, um, we would like you to do this project essentially as a whole. We don't want to see you rip up the middle of town multiple times. Uh, Billy uh, was felt particularly susceptible to that um, and a break in business, as did Mike. Um, they had just repaved paid Route 12, and that created some financial hardship for both of those um, businesses. So. The sidewalk from the intersection to the library was going to be done at a later point in time. Um, we decided, decided to try and include that as part of the project. And they also said, we would like you to consider bearing the utilities as well while you're doing this project. Uh, we said we would look into it. 
Uh, we did. We came back in the fall of 2018 uh, and said, this is what we think it's going to cost. Um, and we put this to the select board. It was about a $500,000 price tag. It was kind of a general estimate. And there was um, multiple people in attendance, upwards to 25, 30 people that would also voiced um, that they would like us to do the utilities. And the select board said we would put that to the voters and let the voters decide. That was in the fall of 2018. Uh, it wasn't until the spring of 2019 that we um, finished the easement process. And the summer of 2019, we applied for a bicycle pedestrian grant. You'll see why that's important when we talk about the funding for this. And um, kind of brings us up to today where when we went and looked at the utilities to bring this to the public, we had two alternatives uh, that we were going to look at. Uh, we thought one would be a little bit cheaper than the other. Uh, unfortunately, it ended up being too much of a burden to one of the property owners. And um, we chose um, essentially what we'll call alternative A over B. And we're putting that to a vote in August of um, 2020. <clears throat> so here are the numbers. So I'm going to, yeah, I don't mean to stretch this out too far, but I'm going to start in May um, or in, um, you know, in May of 2017. And this was when I, just before I came in, uh, we were looking at a project cost. Um, and again, I've got at the bottom here, I've got a total of 644,627. Uh, however, we do have close to $100,000 Queechee Road grant. We've had that since, um, you know, since before I came. And also as a part of that number is, I've got here, it's listed as an ad alternate, but that is the price amount for doing the sidewalk from the post office to the library, at least at this point in time. Uh, bringing the town cost down to 489 for this. Now, what I want you to focus on are these two numbers right here, and I've got it in bold. I've got site engineering at 15% and a 15% contingency. Now, I have added that into the budget. I've actually added it into this discussion. Uh, when I came, we the, the, the construction engineering wasn't, technically included in this, uh, or at least it was underestimated. And there wasn't a contingency um, on the estimate coming out of the engineer. So at that point, you can almost, if you take these two numbers away, uh, you almost come down to a number that's, um, you know, about $340,000. Uh, and that shows that it's within our spending capacity or at least borrowing capacity. Um, at the time, again, because the engineering was underestimated, we kind of came or, or kind of estimated a, a generic $50,000. It was kind of a shoot from the hip number we thought the construction engineering might be. Um, so if you utilize that number, the project cost is about 390, 297. Say, oh, yeah, that's pretty good. Well, I want to remind everybody um, that we have spent about $100,000 on design engineering at this point in time. Uh, when I was here, it was a little bit less than that. So if you add $100,000 onto this number, it's 490, 297. So we have been running about at a bare bones budget, we've been running about forty to $50,000 over, at least uh, according to this estimate. 
Um, again, I put this number in here. This is going to become important as I get to today's budget. But this, these numbers, I feel more comfortable with. I feel more comfortable with a 15% of project cost for my construction engineering. I feel a lot more comfortable having a 15% contingency in there. If we add that in there, then we're over our $450,000 borrowing capacity, actually by quite a bit. I, I have alluded to the fact that the numbers were fairly consistent um, and par for course, they were very consistent right up until I opened my mouth, but um, these numbers are fairly consistent. They actually went down a little bit in October of 2017, this estimate. Um, the project cost is a little bit less. And then they come back up a little bit to the um, 2000, the original 2017 budget. It comes back up a little bit. Um, so these numbers are pretty consistent. Um, again, we're running, you know, if I use the bare bones estimate, we were still $40,000, um, $30,000, $40,000 over. If I utilize these numbers that I really like, then we were a fair amount over budget. So today um, is the budget I have come up with for the underlying project and where we are at today. And when I use this budget, I use my 15% construction engineering cost and I use my 15% contingency. Um, that is, gives a pretty high number. We may or may not need it, but it's in there. Because we have a grant and the state of Vermont says you have to do certain things, we have to have a municipal project manager, $32,000 is added to this. As is uh, an estimate, you know, we talked about the 16,000 that we needed to do for the resource inventory, essentially that categorical exclusion that the bike head program is asking us to do. And we said, you know, let's just throw in, you know, another ten, eleven thousand dollars to make sure we get over the finish line. So I feel pretty good or better about these numbers that I put here than say we were working with back down here. And this number includes the sidewalk from the post office to the library. Now, what we've got here helping us is 269,600 in a bike head grant. Still gives us a project cost of 449,297. You say, oh man, that's not very good. Uh, and it isn't. But, uh, and we did have between, and this is where I went ahead and opened my big mouth and said, yeah, things haven't really changed. Um, but when this came out a couple of weeks ago, uh, there was a jump of about $100,000 in project cost, 479, about 485 total. And up here, you're gonna see that it is um, up to 585. So it's like a $100,000 jump. So uh, I talked to the folks at Bike Pet and said, hey, we've had a $100,000 increase. And they said, okay, well, that happens. Um, reapply and we think you can get additional grant funding. Um, I've been again conservative here on the number I think that we would get. Um, we would apply and um, receive hopefully in the fall this number. That comes according to fruition and again these folks are telling me that's what we should do. Then this number comes down to 381,297. Again, we've spent $100,000 in design engineering, puts us at $481,297. Well, you say we're still over the $450. Well, we are, but you know, I think we can work with a $30,000 um, issue. I think that we can absorb a $30,000 um, situation if that's what we end up with. However, also remind yourself that I've got a 15% contingency in here and perhaps some other monies that we may or may not spend, which I don't think that we had before. And the sidewalk from the post office to the library is now included, and I'm still running just over at 30,000. 
um, over that 450. But again, that 15% contingency is in there. If just for the sake of discussion, I don't think I can do this. Um, can you still hear me? No. Okay. Uh, if you look at the budget without a contingency, um, you know, I'm at 327 at the 100,000, I'm at 427, which is below. If I cut it in half, I say, heck, I'll try a 7.5% contingency. I'm almost right on target at, at the 100,000 at 454. So the bed, bike ped program has helped us tremendously. Um, we are still short. Uh, however, the folks at the bike ped program say, okay, um, the increase is justifiable. Um, apply for the differential, and we think you can get the money. Now I go through that entire process, one, to let everybody know where we are at from a budget perspective on the underlying projects. However, it lays the foundation for why we're really here tonight, which is for the utility project. And why do I come up with those numbers? Well, they're the same numbers, except for they're bigger because the project cost, ultimately we have the utilities baked in here. So the project cost now becomes bigger Therefore, the 15% number becomes bigger. So just for construction engineering and contingency, that's almost over $300,000. Uh, but the numbers are in there. I think they're the right numbers. Um, these are up-to-date estimates, uh, including, and we went out and got detailed estimates because we didn't want to be too far off when the time comes to vote. Uh, so without any grants involved, um, the total project cost would be $1,403,930. However, we do have grant money involved. Um, and if you take into um, possible additional grant monies, it comes down to 961. But for the sake of the warning, and I'll get to that in a minute, um, the warning, I've used this number but the warning says we may get additional grant monies and we can factor that in. Um, but I want everybody to know how I came up with this 1403930. -9 we have the grant money and this is grant money we've already received. This brings it down to 1,041,151. So because We've signed a certain piece of paper when we did about a year and a half ago. It allows us to bring in some of our prior expenses. Uh, we can pull in about $20,000 worth of engineering, design engineering <clears throat> into the bond. So the amount that I have got on the paperwork for the town to ask for to bond for this project would be 1,061,151.77. Seventy-seven. Well, I'll round up. But anyway, um, that's where the numbers come from, and where the number that is on the warning as presented to the select board tonight, which we will sign on July six. So, Gordon, I'll stop it here to answer any questions <coughs> regarding the budgetary numbers. Good. So I guess we're open for questions if anybody wants to. This is John Bruno. Um, yep. On the um, so the vote in August is to approve the five hundred thousand dollars for the utilities, or to allow the town to bond the one million four hundred or whatever the million dollar plus. It, we would essentially um, refinance this project, John. So we would bond the one million forty-one one fifty-one. I do add twenty thousand to that to pull in some of the design engineering costs. But we would bond for essentially one million sixty-one thousand one fifty-one. Um, right, but to, but, the, to do, but the to do to do the underlying project and the utilities. Um, Right, but the warrant, is the warrant going to read uh, 
to bury the utilities and bond the 1,061,000? So, John, I, I've got a copy of the warning. Just let me get, um, let me answer any finance, any budgetary questions, and then I'll get, I'll get to the warning. I'll tell you exactly what the warning's going to say. Okay. So, Dave, I have some I have some questions um, that I imagine are dealt with in statute. So, if you know the answer, that would be awesome. Um, and if not, you can point me to the statute, and I'll be happy to read it or call the Secretary of State or whatever is necessary to figure it out. But the question is about design and engineering. So this design and engineering, you said we're in $100,000 for that. But I presume that $100,000 has been getting paid out of the general fund as it has been um, invoiced. And the article that was approved by the voters was to borrow up to $450,000 from the capital reserve fund. So up to now, we haven't actually borrowed anything from the capital reserve fund, have we? Even though we have paid the 100,000 in design and engineering because those costs have come out of the general fund or how does that work? How does that balancing work in the budget? So, yep, so, and um, it is documented in the audit. So we talked about this with the auditors to make sure the numbers are, are on par with what we've borrowed. But um, we, when we, except for maybe a small amount in the very beginning um, that we may have paid for directly out of the general fund. We pay for it out of the general fund, but then reimburse the general fund from the capital projects fund with that money. So we have essentially at this point in time borrowed from the capital projects fund close to $100,000. Okay. Okay. This is... Does this that is, mean, John Bruno, does that mean there's only $350,000 left in order to conform to the vote that can be borrowed from the uh, capital fund? So, John, when I, so for instance, so we've got the $450,000 number. So when I've been talking about these numbers right here, I have tacked on that $100,000 as I have discussed this with you. So right here, this shows a 381, 297 number. That's actually below the 450. Okay, I would, I would be sweeping very tight with that number. Right. Uh, however, add the hundred thousand on to that is 481, 297. So we're technically, you know, estimated. Again, some of these expenses are estimated, estimating that we could potentially be thirty-one thousand dollars over the 450. Uh, how are these are these grants other than I guess the sixty eight thousand dollar one which you're applying for are the other grant uh, and I guess the ninety three thousand dollars I guess the question I'm asking is the two hundred and sixty nine thousand four hundred dollar grant locked in at this point? Uh, it it is yes. Okay. We were actually we received this. Maybe September of 2009. What are we in now? 2020. We received it in 2019. Okay. This so is the, so basically the only thing hanging out there is the 68,000 that you're going to be applying for this September. Yep. John, I think there's someone else trying to get in. Yeah, Gordon, it's Sarah Bruce. Yes. Um, on each one of these um, tables, you have an entry that has no money listed on any of them that I saw, and I don't know what it is, and you've just taken it off, so I need to read the title. It's something about full CE something CIS. What is that? And you have it in every one. Is there a possibility that, in fact, there will be something added for whatever that is? Uh, nope. It, uh, we've actually taken it away. What is it? It was, hold on, I gotta get my, my screen back here. 
So the full CE items uh, was an item that the engineer uh, had on their estimate. It was about $15,000, $16,000 for like a, an engineering you know, trailer and some materials and stuff that uh, they would need. But in discussions with certain people, um, by hiring this by, and that was the only engineering budget line item that we really had, by hiring and factoring in this construction engineer, um, one, we don't think they're going to need a trailer uh, for this particular site. And two, they should be bringing whatever they need to bring with them. So this line item really um, isn't needed. Okay. And then just to confirm, you have on each table the very bottom line uh, that says so much for town costs. And yep. what you're saying with regards to the 100000 that has already been paid for the engineering and design, um, all of those numbers, like the 381 that you're on right now, is really 100000 more yep. total. But the 100000 has actually been paid for, borrowed from the capital fund. Is that right? Correct. Thank you. Um, Dave, uh, Matt Dunn has asked a question on the chat and he should jump in if he wants to. Uh, hey, Dave, uh, two, two questions. One is, uh, and it, it may just because it it is more comfortable on a budget basis, uh, but we use seven and a half percent in order to get to a number that you felt we could uh, live with and still use the uh, the, the current uh, lending or borrowing capacity of the town. Uh, it's 7.5 percent, and then in the uh, estimate that's going to be presented to the voters for bearing the utility, you use 15 percent. Um, and the difference between 15 percent and seven and a half percent, especially of that larger number, is uh, significant. Um, is there a reason to believe that there is, you know, proportionally greater risk with the bearing the utility lines of that, of, of going way over budget? It just, it, it so, sort of stands out in the comparison. So I'm just going to back up and, and, you know, I put out the seven and a half and the 0% contingency is kind of a comparison. So essentially the under, let's just stick with the underlying project for a second, mm -hmm. Matt. Yep. The underlying, the underlying project has a range, you know, with a range of 0% contingency to a 15% contingency. Yep. I, I'm either $20,000 below or $30,000 over the 450 number. That's straddling it. But, you know, going into a project after eight, nine years and it being fairly substantial project, I think that's pretty good. Sure. I like, I like the 15% number. That makes me comfortable. Sure. Okay. That gives me a little bit of, you know, if we goof, we get out there and hit ledge. If we get out there and hit something unknown, we go another two years. There's there's a, a number in there that's just at a contingency. Um, so I carry, again, this 7.5% and the 0% was there to kind of give you where we're at with that $450,000 number. Mm -hmm. I come over and I carry that 15% number over to the util over to the does everybody see that? Yep. I carry that over to the utility project. Same 15% number. Okay. Engineer says, boy, that's pretty conservative. $153,000 for that project. You know, that's a lot to have in there for contingency. I speak with the state of Vermont, and they're like, no, we like that number. Um, it is it is just that you know a contingency and i think that if we um you know in factored that in a little bit earlier we would be a little bit more comfortable at this point um you know given the fact that there is some complexity matt to you know bearing the cables um you know just it's it, that project is actually more complex than the underlying project um i my recommendation is just that to carry that, but it you're right, it's a pretty big number. Um, as is 
construction engineering, which I would hope that would come in a little bit lower than that. Yeah. But, you know, I'm hearing that that tends to be where things fall or where you should be. Um, so that's what I'm recommending. Now, I should note that if the project goes out to bid, and let's just say this it comes in 100 grand less, or project goes according to plan, and we don't use any of that 153, hmm. we've borrowed the number. You can still, you can't prepay essentially, but you can use that number, you can use that excess to repay that loan over the next several years, as long as you've got that money available to repay it, you know, kind of providing a buffer to the tax rate. So just because you borrow it doesn't mean you need to use it. You can actually put it back towards um, the principal. Um, Matt, I just want to jump in for just a minute. I think mm -hmm. I could take um, most of the blame for asking Dave to try uh, smaller contingencies. Dave and I had some pretty long discussions about this and uh, in an effort to um, keep within our budget of $450,000, we were looking for various ways to make it work out. And that's why these other possibilities are listed. And, and, and my point, Gordon, is that if you're going to present that as sort of the, the, um, the alternative to the, uh, the complete project that includes carrying the utilities it's not really apples to apples it may not matter in the end but if you i mean it's a matter of yeah, you're, like yeah. 150,000 dollars if you if you went with a seven and a half percent contingency on the uh on the project that includes bearing the utility line uh it would be a hundred and fifty thousand dollar difference which is yes you're, you're right matt you're right, Matt, but I think what's going to happen here is that we're going to forget all about the zero and the seven and a half percent and go with the 15 on everything. Because that's what uh, um, Dave has looked in very seriously, he spent a lot of time on this. And uh, for the selectman to, to change his mind uh, for no particular good reason uh, doesn't make a lot of sense. I, I get it. I get and, it. And, I'm, and we can make this work. Uh, we have to remember the si additional sidewalk, which is one of the main reasons why this is over. So we can make this work without lowering the contingency. I think what Matt, like the way I see it, Matt is kind of worried, like it doesn't seem honest and it seems like kind of a scary number uh, when you make the contingency larger. That is less worrisome to me. What my question is, is since we're bonding it, the town is actually motivated to accurately estimate the costs because anything we borrow has attendant costs that come with it. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question is, as you were saying, Dave, if we over borrowed and then we use that and reapplied that to the principal by the time the project finished, say two years, um, after two years, we take that $75,000, we put it back into the principal, how much will having borrowed that extra $75,000 cost the town? What will be the actual cost of having that buffer? That's that's something I'd be interested in knowing. So let me give you two answers. Um, one, that's really complicated. Yeah. I, I'm not even sure I can give you the answer because it really depends on where the project ends. Yeah. You know, is it gonna be, you know, the project goes perfectly and we don't use a contingency or we hit ledge and, and other problems and it is, you know, we use it. So depending on where that falls is, um, you know, what we're going to end up with for excess. So, I, you know, it's really difficult. And even, you know, I, I do have a tax rate scenario to show you. And even then I got to use an average number because the payment the first year is, you know, more than the, the last payment. So, you know, if you want to, how this is going to affect the tax rate, I kind of had to use an average, kind of talking almost the same thing there. But let me address Matt's question. And, and I think it's important to differentiate the underlying conversation, the underlying project conversation and the contingency versus the the utility budget and what we've got with there. It's almost, you know, I showed you 
a lot of that to show you how I came up with that utility number um, for a budget. Matt, I'm just gonna, you know, this is just my experience um, mm -hmm. I've been in a couple of these projects. Uh, I'm just gonna throw out the Norwich Fire Station to you. Um, we got into a discussion where it became political. The whole idea of the contingency almost became political. You know, if we had the contingency, it's a higher number of people aren't gonna vote for it. If it's a lower contingency, the town's not gonna use it. It's more palatable. We were working, you know, these are pretty strong estimates we put together here. Um, but with Norwich, they were, weren't, they were more, um, they weren't quite as strong. They went with no contingency for the political reason that they just felt it looked better on the ballot. And right off the bat, the estimates came in, before they even went to construction, the estimates came in higher, which means that they were automatically over budget and sucking wind and they they tried to pull some things out of the project uh and other things they brought it down uh the project more towards the borrowing limit and then during construction they went over so you know all because they didn't want to throw the contingency in there for political reasons of what would look good or what would look better for a vote you know i'm going to come back to this is a project you know, this is how much it's going to cost. I, you know, you can battle over, you know, an 8% versus a 15% contingency, but I wouldn't go in any less than 10. This is John Bruno. I've been involved in engineering estimates and construction for over 50 years, and the 15% is a good number. And just to like sort of answer my my own question is let's say that we double estimated the contingency we actually required and we only really needed 7.5 percent. The cost of having that extra contingency if it were a three year project and we immediately applied the balance of it and we have like a three point or a three percent APY is six thousand dollars or something like that. So that's how much would be paid just to have that buffer zone. And like you say, it's a lot cheaper to have a buffer zone than run into a problem. <laughs> yeah, this is Phil. I, I just would con concur from another world that I lived in for 35 years and dealing with projects of the size of three to five million uh, we always had contingencies of in that 15% range. Uh, and they saved me many times from going back for monies that just weren't allocated. Um, and there are times where I, I returned money uh, and things look really good. So I, I would sort of say we're doing best practices, if nothing else, and we should leave these contingencies where they are. So we're looking for other comments or questions. Dave, I had a question about applying that 20,000. As I was from design and engineering, as I was reading the warning, I saw the 1,061,000 and I, saw, I thought to myself, this number came out of nowhere. So how can that 20,000 be applied to this warning and not the total? And why would we want to apply this 20,000, not the balance? Uh, it's, it's basically, you know, we can't because we, so I don't have, I'd have to go through a lot of files, but in your packet, there is a piece of paper you will need to sign on January 6th. It's called a declaration of intent. Yeah. Uh, and that is essentially a legal paper that's, you're, you're declaring your intent to do the project. You're declaring your intent to borrow. Um, when you declare that and when you sign it, it gives you the ability for a certain amount of time before a project to uh, utilize those expenses as part of project expenses. 
We signed one of those maybe a year and a half ago. We updated it again last November and we'll update it here next, next meeting. Uh, that allows us to pull in, um, you know, anything. Again, I can't, I can't remember the timeline, but, um, you know, the timeline as to when you sign it. 60 um, days. Unfortunately, most of those expenses, uh, the design engineering, you know, as I put in that timeline, you know, preliminary design was presented to the town back in December of 2015. So that, you know, predates that declaration of intent by three years. So that's just money we can't pull in. Um, you know, so a, a caveat to remember is that at 80,000 will still need to be paid back to the capital project fund. You know, that's still money we've borrowed and we'll need to pay that back. Um, but that 80 is not part of this bonding, but 20,000 of it can be. Um, and that's because you estimate in the 60 days prior to January or July 6th, we will have spent 20,000 or that's what we have spent thus far. Okay. So I had Martin go back um, as to how much we've spent um, since, wait, maybe January of 2018. Um, I think it was January 8th of 2018 that we signed the first one. So I didn't bother going back before that. I don't think there was a whole lot of activity my first six months here that, um, you know, we did on this. Uh, so, you know, from January 8th of 2018 to present day, there was about $20,000 worth of expenses. And um, that's how we came up with that number. It was just okay. under 20. Thank you. Uh, Dave, um, we don't seem to be getting a lot of comments here, but uh, I would like to change the uh, um, type of what we're discussing just a little bit, because uh, I'm thinking to the um, two lists of comments that you sent um, everyone last night, one from Matt and one from Gary, and they dealt, those were dealt more, more basically with, do we do the project at all? Do we do it with now or do we do it later? Uh, how much is going to, uh, how is it going to be paid back? Uh, and um, whether we, whether it's wise to bury the uh, cables or not. So I, I have a few comments that I would like to make in those regards and then uh, maybe it'll inspire someone to ask a, a question or two. So I'll start with you, Matt. Um, you, you mentioned, I, I, I just don't, I want it to be perfectly fair how, how these things are commented on and you use the word couple um, two different times referring to paying back the $450,000, meaning two years. Uh, a couple is always two. And in fact, it's five years. So I just want to make that clear. Um, I, want, I also want to make the point that we are, would be removing one pole and all of the wires. And there's no question in my mind that it would look a lot better. But we do have to remember that we're going to add poles on all the ends where it comes back out of the ground again and, and conduits that go up the poles. So we're going to lose one pole, but we're going to gain three or four more. And there's nothing pretty about them. Um, and, and my concern also is that it's a, such a tiny portion of the village. And this brings me to a question for John Bruno, if he can answer it. How, if we looked at this project um, in, uh, bearing the wires and doing it piecemeal or doing it all at once, would it make sense to move forward with doing the little teeny part now if we thought we were going to do the whole village set some other time? Um, and just hold on your answer just for a minute. And um, Gary, I thought your comments were really good. And I thought Matt's were too. I'm not diminishing Matt's comments. But um, Gary's main main point, I think, was let's get on with it, not uh, put it off any longer. 
and and I would agree 100%. So John, can can you give me any idea of is it really that much of a of a deal to come back and bury wires at another time? Oh, you're tearing up. <coughs> you're basically tearing you're up. You're going to pay a premium because you're tearing up what you've already done. Yeah. Um. So. Uh, um, what if that was in conjunction with a, a much larger project, though, of, of burying the wires um, where they should be buried, all the way to the edges of the village? Well, you're going to pay, if you, if, you, if you do the improvement without the burying the electrical or burying the utilities, and then you come back and bury the utilities, you're going to have an additional cost of putting everything back together again that you just tore up. Yeah. I can see that. Uh, so there is, there would be a savings. I, I have no idea what that would be, um, but you know that that cost would um, uh, you'd have to restore it to what you know what it was before you tore it up. So you yeah. have additional paving costs. You're going to have additional disturbance costs. Uh, uh, <coughs> um, Gordon, I, I sure response yeah. and then i have a question uh first off i your comment about additional poles i don't really think is relative the focus really has been the pole with the north south east west or east or west i guess just west poles and the other poles are not con it's consequential um they're there uh, and having the wires come out of the ground is is inevitable, but they're going to be, I don't think there is going to be as many poles as you just suggested. Um, the second is, is that uh, a question for you uh, that I don't understand with this budget, and maybe there's something that's been changed is, I can remember asking when, when I first got on the board and this came up about whether the green space would have uh, was there money to do landscaping? But most importantly, uh, was the asphalt underneath that north-south section of Route 5, the cutoff, uh, was that concrete going to be removed? And I still have not gotten an answer to that. Yeah, neither, neither have I, Phil, and that is very important. And I hope that isn't where we spend our contingency because it, the point was made several times that we're not going to make grass grow on six inches of topsoil on top of concrete. It just isn't going to work unless it rains every day. Um, so I don't know the answer to that. But so I can, I can answer, we've, we've actually answered that question before. Um, the thought was is that it really wouldn't be all that much to do you're digging up the pavement you got the excavator there you know a little bit more into the trucks you know you may have a little bit more back and forth with a couple of trucks but um the thought was is that it really wouldn't add too significantly well, to the project that's good i want to but, it, but it's not in the it's not in the present estimate yeah john I, john I think you felt as though it really wasn't um it was based upon what we've got going on there, I think you felt, you know, that north south from that one side to the other and digging that up, we're already digging up the pavement right above it. Um, the thought was is that you really weren't adding, you know, in a, in a, hardly anything to the project. Yeah, that's where budgets go wrong, I'm afraid. Here's a, here's a map. I mean, for maybe this is for Matt's information. I don't know if everybody can see this, but this is done in, in 2015. And but is there any place for trees? Here we have the arc. There are one, two, three, four, five, six trees planted over near the sidewalk. I, I, it's not fair to say there's no place to plant, plant trees with if the pole is left there, because there is. As long as we miss the wires. This is John Bruno. I have a question on the on the budget or on the original on the estimate of 
uh, without bear on the original estimate without burying the lines. There's no dollars in the utilities line, so there would be no utility costs involved in the uh, in just doing the intersection. I uh, yeah, I believe that's correct. Utilities stay where they are. There is uh, there is some drainage uh, in there, John. Um, but as far as the cables overhead. Um, they stay stay as is. Okay, I, I'm you know it, I'm just you know everything's gonna be working around it, and just want to make sure that there are no utility costs that are gonna be involved just because of the construction that's going on, um, not relocation or anything, but. You're going to be working around these utilities, and is this a, is there is there been something factored in uh, on that? I, I, just a question. So, John, I don't know what you know. The the estimates provided for the actual you know work to the to the intersection and the sidewalks. Um, you know, I I don't know if there's a certain number in that number there. You know, so what is it five ninety seven or five seventy eight for for the work? Uh, for the underlying project, another eight or so for the erosion, um, you know, but um, I don't, you know, again, the underlying project, there is there is drainage work, but um, not anything, you know, they may have to work around or, you know, work with a telephone pole or something to that effect. Um, but as far as moving a telephone pole or having Green Mountain Power come in and relocate, um, I don't believe that that has been discussed as an issue. No, I understand that. Uh, Dave, uh, I, are you letting people into the meeting? I just got a text. Is it Matt Dunn? His, his ears must be burning because every time we're talking about something else he leaves and as soon as we start talking about something of interest to him he just pops right back into the meeting uh matt matt froze up for a while so let me just finish um let me just take a moment to just get to john bruno's question real quick um i had a number up there uh, as to what this means, I've had several questions to me personally as to what it means to the tax rate. For the underlying project, uh, and this is for a 20 year payback. Again, the first couple of years is more up towards 70. Um, the later part of the year is just down into the 50s, but the average payback is about $65,503 a year uh, based upon the um, the, the grand list that we just used for this fiscal year, it would be an increase to the tax rate of essentially one and a half cent per hundred dollars of assessed valuation. That translates and I generally use a $250,000 assessed value household seems to be about the average in Heartland. Um, might be getting out of that range these days, but um, 250 seems to be about right. Uh, that is $36.50 um, to your tax bill. So this year on a $250,000 valuation, this is just municipal now, not including education, just the municipal tax. Remember, education is about 80% of your tax bill. So on a $250,000 house, uh, this year would have been about close to $1,300. Add the 36.50, and um, this year your tax bill would have been 13.08.50. Uh, for the $90,000 a year payback, um, that's $90,000 a year. That would be over a five-year period. Uh, it's about a two cent um, increase, uh, or two cents per $200 uh, or $100 assessed value. Adds about $50 to your tax bill for a $250,000 house. Lastly, John, just to get to your question, what the uh, actual warning would look like. The warning is going to end up. 
can get there. So this is what your ballot's actually going to look like uh, day of voting. So the language basically reads, shall the general obligation bonds or notes, town of Heartland in an amount not to exceed $1,062,000. Again, that's the $1,042,000 plus the $20,000 in design engineering that we can pull in. There's a possibility we're going to get more grant money in the fall. So the next sentence reads, subject to reduction from the receipt of available state and federal grants and aid. Uh, this should be issued for the purpose of financing the cost of making certain public improvements, essentially the reconstruction and reconfiguration of the Route 12 and 5 intersection, including utility relocation. And then it gives the actual cost of the project, John. So it then goes on to say an estimated cost of $1,425,000. So it's kind of confusing, but the intent is to be, uh, again, a lawyer wrote this, but uh, to be transparent that the, 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 the actual project cost is 1425 That includes the $20,000 design engineering we're going to pull into it. We've got essentially 360 something thousand dollars in grant money at the moment, so it ends up with a net amount of 1062000 that you're actually asking the voter to borrow. If you're in favor of that, then you check this box here. And if not, you check that one. Does that clarify anything for you, John? Or No, that's fine. Thank you. OK. And Davis, I sort of said to you once you're ready today, that confuses the heck out of me. Having the two numbers uh, and the last number being the 14, 1,425. Yep. Is there any way that we can, that general counsel will sort of change that? Uh, maybe, but again, the intent here is um, that the project cost is there. Um, I believe that that may even be a part of the, the necessary warning. You have grants involved, and the net result is one million sixty-two. Phil, just like going to the shop shopping center, price and then the discounted price looks like a bargain to me. Uh, regardless, there are two numbers in there, and the last number is the higher number. Uh, that's generally speaking what people react to. Um, so. Um, Hello, Dave. This is Chuck Benton. Something we haven't spoken about since we're borrowing money for 20 years is the long-term maintenance cost on this project. You pointed out to me in a phone conversation that we will be doing the improvements, but the state of Vermont will essentially own most of the project, most of the territory on which the project sits, and that you feel that they will be then still responsible for maintenance. Now, in the winter, as one example, they've been dumping a mountain of snow, salty snow, on that triangle, and you said that they may still continue to do that. So I'm concerned if we look at the state's history of providing maintenance, it's pretty poor. I mean, look at the condition of E5, it's nothing but potholes and invasive weeds. So if we wanted to undertake the maintenance on the project going forward to try to keep it beautified, have we done any estimates of what our, our cost, our investment in long-term maintenance might be? And specifically, I have a question about the utilities. If there's salty snow piled on top of the intersection where the utilities are buried, 
I think those of us that have underground service knows that the cost of repair on dairy utilities is much higher than the cost of overhead repair. And if we have salty water running down to the ground, it's inevitable there might be repair costs involved. And I'm wondering who is going to be responsible for repairing the underground utilities? So you had a whole bunch of questions wrapped up in there. I'm not sure I can totally answer the last one, um, although I'll tell you what my guess is. But uh, so this is the very end. People were quick to point out, look, it's a state highway. Um, that's truly what is unique about this project is the town has chosen to take on a project that is state highway. <clears throat> Generally, such as Woodstock on Route 4 and Windsor and Route 5, um, a town enters into essentially a maintenance agreement with the state of Vermont and takes over a segment of road, making it easier to put crosswalks and, and other things into that segment. But the flip side is you have to maintain that road. So for instance, Woodstock does have potholes all through Route 4 because Woodstock Town or Woodstock Village is responsible for that maintenance. We have not entered into that contract with the state of Vermont. Um, state of Vermont, this is still a state highway. What we're trying to achieve is to obtain a 1111 permit from the state of Vermont, allowing us to work within the right of way. They're essentially approving the design and every other aspect of this. We have to have additional state oversight, um, which is budgeted. Um, they also want a person on site um, from time to time to make sure that we're doing what we should be doing. Uh, I don't think we would normally get that oversight um, if it was a different situation, but um, we do not take control of Route 5 and Route 12, to my knowledge, following this project. And, uh... Chuck, I would like to answer your question that uh, maintenance would be more expensive as far as the utilities is concerned. It's actually just the opposite. Uh, at your home, when utilities are buried, they're not buried within an, a tunnel-like situation, um, which, which they would be in this particular case. Um, so, in fact, the utilities' cost of maintenance goes down, and the ability for a utility to run new cables or different cables is much, much easier um, than it would be if it was another cable to your house. Uh, Chuck, I would try to answer the question about the triangle. If we spend money on shrubbery and trees and uh, artwork or whatever in that triangle, we're not going to allow the state to fill it full of salty snow in the wintertime. They're, they're going to have to take their snow somewhere else. I wouldn't be concerned about that. Another, uh, another question that I have, as you know, we're being encouraged to buy local, especially when it comes to food, but also to um, any kind of uh, transactions that takes place. And so my question is, this is a pretty large project um, being done on state property. Dave just said it's going to be overseen by an inspector from the state. So my question is, what will be the opportunity for Heartland or local contractors, local people to participate in this project? Or is it estimated that we'll just be sending this money off Lord knows where to some major contractor like Pipe Industries or someplace. Is there any opportunity for any local uh, participation in this project? So the answer is yes and no. Uh, it's going to be an open bid process. Um, however, I believe that the state is going to um, request that they're pre qualified. And uh, John might be able to answer that a little bit more, but um, they're going to need to have shown experience on um, you know, a project such as this. So if somebody doesn't have experience um, in conducting, um, you know, if somebody comes in as a low bid and they're not, you know, on the state's radar, um, they may be weeded out. 
So they're going to be looking for somebody, and as would we um, as well, we're going to be looking for somebody to trust um, as well as whoever may be the low bidder. Yeah, typically you may ask for, um, uh, before you actually put the bid, up, or while you're asking for bid, you might ask for interested parties and their qualifications, and then you would limit your bid to those uh, companies that actually have the, um, you know, that are on the VTRANS approved list. Uh, Dave, I have a question. Are, are the plans in final design stage or is there more engineering re required to come up with final design plans so we are we are essentially at final design john um and it's kind of splitting hairs but we're not it's we're not at bid design um so we are um and and that goes for the utility design as well uh, and the utility would just essentially, I'm making this simplistic, but kind of overlaid onto the existing um, project plans. But it's still, and this is why the bike pet program is actually kind of a good thing. It's actually in review right now with the various aspects of VTRANS, um, which it's already been through for the 1111 permit, and we'll need to go back to Teresa Gilman for the 1111 permit. So there may be some tweaks, uh, you know, to this final VTRANS discussion. And that's as if, you know, it's also just assuming that there's no issues with the resource inventory that's currently underway. You know, if things continue to move forward, then, you know, I kind of talked about it in that that design, that $27,000 I had in that last budget for the underlying project is also in the utility. 16 was, and again, Grant money is involved in that. That was for kind of the, the resource inventory and the archaeological dig. There's maybe about eleven thousand dollars in there to get us over the finish line in case there is anything from, you know, the final to to bid design. Um, but it's been presented in final format to um, the state of Vermont once. We did do some tweaks when we when Matt Dunn and I talked about some re. re real detailed stuff in front of his uh, porch and around, you know, the driveway or the parking lot goes up to a couple of feet from his porch. So there's some real questions as to how that's going to work and we tweak some things. But essentially it's, um, it's there um, and it has been for almost two years. We've been kind of, you know, playing around with the easements and the utility question. Um, we did do the, the design for the utilities in that period of time. But we're kind of hankering to, you know, <laughs> represent this to the to the state. You know, we just we need to know whether the utilities are going to be involved or not before we do that. Okay. Thanks. Hey, this is uh, Chuck Benton again. Getting back to the buried the underground utilities. Uh, those of us who have homes that with underground service know that we have to pay that cost of having underground service brought from the newest uh, pole or transformer. And I'm curious, I think you mentioned at some point there was an estimate of cost per service in the area that's going to receive underground. Do you recall what that cost is and are the recipients the either businesses or homes are they going to contribute part of that to recover part of that cost of getting underground service uh, i don't know if that's completely been fleshed out yet uh chuck to tell you the truth um there may be um one or two buildings that may need to be upgraded if the underground utility is to come in um, but that will need to be that'll need to be fleshed out. Um, I don't really care to put that work effort into it until I know whether we're even going to contemplate that. So that would be probably one of the final things um, to kind of close this out. And then I have one final question. Since I recall back in 18, in the fall of 18, when this discussion came up and was presented to the select board, 
there was some discussion that, like in Woodstock, which their project was almost exclusively paid by private donations, that there might be an opportunity for private participation, private donations in this project, especially since it seems some people who are supporting it might have that capacity. And I'm wondering, have, has there been any expression of private donation interest? Uh, have any been received? Or do you anticipate any private donations uh, might be received to offset the cost? I think there's always some discussion and hope that, you know, somebody will magically come out of um, the air and solve some of our problems. Uh, two things working against that, you know, I think that um, the answer is, the quick answer is no. Um, we have not, um, you know, looking at being dependent on um, somebody donating or multiple people donating money to do it. Um, and two, that would probably take um, a, um, a concerted effort, not that it can't be undertaken, but I, you know, at this point, the project needs to move forward. Uh, you know, we do have partners involved at this point in time, uh, which is the state of Vermont, which always likes to see things keep moving, even though to a point they've held us up. Uh, so we would essentially need to, you know, have that activity and try and raise that money. Um, in the meantime, you know, if you don't or, you know, whichever way, um, you know, still needs to go forward. So quick answer is no. Um, looking to move this forward somewhat realistically thinking that the taxpayer will pay for it. Um, I haven't heard anybody step forward and, and offer to try and capture that money, um, nor have I heard anybody move forward or step forward and say they'll pay for it. Go fund me. Uh, Dave, there are quite a few questions in the chat function that I don't think all of them have been answered. Thank you, Martha. Yeah, Dave, put it up. Oh, he keeps moving so fast. You already answered that first one from Matt. Yeah, so it starts with Stuart, according to how I've been watching it. Or no, Matt has a second one. Um, could you add on the end of the article of which X has already been received in grant dollars? Uh, can you say that again, Curtis? I, I got to scroll down a little bit more, I guess. We have, I think there's this Stuart. Stuart has the question about the tax rate, which we already talked about. Okay. Then he has a question about the impact on the plaza and BGs. And then the next question is Matt Dunn's asking about adding something to the end of people, and then it continues from there. So we've had extensive conversations with Bill uh, <coughs> and the engineer, and taking that left-hand turn, um, we've received an easement from Bill. Um, I'm not sure if that means he's completely comfortable with the project. But we have considered it and we've had had those discussions. Um, Dave, David, this is Stuart. Yep. Um, I, I had I've had a few conversations with Bill about the whole thing and, and neither of us are convinced that the exit from the parking lot into a four way intersection without the roundabout uh, uh use of exit five as it is now i mean route five as it is now will work at all uh, you're going to reduce that exit to one lane and expect people to come out of there into a left or a right situation that is is hard to do when there's traffic now so neither of us are convinced that'll work and he's actually looking at options on trying to route 
traffic out of that parking lot otherwise otherwise at his own expense uh, it it doesn't make any sense that parking lot um the parking lot itself um you would need to speak to the prior owner of that property um who put the bank there and and probably the access permit in and out of there and what he needed to do um, was probably a part of that conversation um the fact that it's a one way and you've got the the bank teller um didn't really have anything to do with the town um had a lot to do with the property and putting the bank there and the state probably wanting to streamline traffic coming in and out of there um taking a right out of the post office i i personally i think will probably act much like it does now um taking a left i would agree is probably going to be um depending on the time of day that you're trying to get out of there seven to eight in the morning and four to five at night uh you will most likely need to work with um, the person that is in the lane looking to continue on Route 5 coming through that intersection. So, uh, Bill Bill is concerned about it. Uh, I, I don't know if he's comfortable coming forward with his concerns, but um, he is looking at a significant reduction in business due to this project. And I don't, I don't know if it's been identified as to exactly what that means because you know in the in the last few months it's been imperative to have his business there for us and uh i would hate to see that impacted uh Stuart, you know, i i don't have a good answer for you other than that it's been in the design stage for five years um and i i am aware of bill's concerns um, and we're at final design at this point. Um, you know, I don't have, you know, I, I've heard Bill, I, I, I understand and I would agree, Bill probably doesn't want to participate in the public forum, um, but we have worked together and, um, you know, at this point, um, you know, it, I don't see going back on the design unless people wanted to vote another $75,000 for the project so we can redesign it. Well, I think it kind of brings me to my next point is, is the, uh, if you vote no in August, does that mean that uh, we're paying a different way and how does that impact the, the uh, budget at that point? I think that your two points on your uh, impact to taxpayers is is that result, is that not? Um, I'm not sure I caught the second question there. So the, the, the question is, uh, you put up some impact to the taxpayers, yep. and one was the full uh, bond issue and okay. how that over time impacts the tax rate. And okay. if you don't bond it, how that impacts the tax rate. And I, I noticed there's a $20 per average of $250,000 household uh, impact. Yep, yep. Um, is that the difference of voting yes in August or voting no in August? So if you vote yes, it's an increase. If I recall, I can pull it up again, but um, it's an increase, I think, of $32.50. And that 32.50 to your tax rate would carry for 20 years. If you vote no and the project continues uh, as scheduled and we pay back the $450,000 over a five year period of time, on a $250,000 house, the tax increase was $50. So it's like a $15 differential more. Um, so it's $50 more to your tax rate over that five year period of time, but then that drops off after the fifth year. <clears throat> so for 50, for five years, um, you know, it's a, it's a $15 differential uh, in your favor if you vote for the utilities um, for the five year period of time. Um, but, that's you know, over, and, but that's over a 20 year period. So, so you're going to be paying 
thirty-six dollars a year over over twenty years versus fifty dollars for five years. Correct. So it's two hundred and fifty dollars versus uh, versus seven hundred and twenty dollars. Thank you, John. I didn't I didn't take the time to do that math. So I think there are probably lots of different ways to communicate to the voters exactly how this will impact them. Total amount over the life of the project, total amount over the average tenure in a home, all of these different things. But how exactly those numbers are generated and used to convince voters to vote either yes or no is, I believe, a political um, decision for the advocates of one side or another um, and not really something that we should be yeah. doing much here. Dave, Dave pointed this out once already, but I'll do it one more time. Our municipal taxes represent about 20% of your bill. So you've got to multiply those numbers that John gave you by five to cover the school. Um, and I would like to answer Stuart's question about um, the parking lot at Fiji's just a little bit. Uh, I think about 20% of the traffic goes around the curve on that uh, intersection. So if it all goes through the four-way stop, it's going to be like 20% more than what we're used to. So, and because of the reconfiguration, the stop line has moved closer to Billy's exit. And so anything he can do to move it further to the right and limit it to one lane is going to make it work a lot better. And if you sat there for five minutes and couldn't get out and turn left, I think you might have sense enough to turn right, turn around at the library or something. But <laughs> surely there's a oh. solution and it wouldn't be all that bad. Um, many of the questions I see coming up on the chat are about the specific language in the warning. Dave, maybe could you tell us, instead of addressing each of those or before addressing each of those individually, could you tell us what the process of writing that warning is? Have Is there some statute we need to follow that specifies things are in a certain order? Um, or is the language pretty changeable by us as a board? The answer is no, you can't just, you know, the board, um, I would leave it in the hands of the lawyer. Um, he's also there to protect you for any challenges to the vote or as to making sure it was clear and concise. Uh, I did see one. I didn't get that far on Matt Dunn's. Um, you might be able to put in the actual number um, of grant revenue, but it's left, um, it is left as is because there is additional grant monies that could still come in. Um, that is, you know, again, to err on the side of conservatism, uh, we don't have in our pocket yet. Um, so that's why that language is there. And so to put, you know, we've got 269, you know, and then plus, you know, anything that may or may not come in, you know, that sentence may be difficult. But that's one I think you can probably entertain. But I think that the lawyer felt strongly that, um, you know, that you have the project cost involved. Um, and unless you want to borrow for that entire project cost, um, you know, you show the net result showing what the actual borrowed amount is going to be. And then he kind of uses legal -less terms to, you know, utilizing, you know, basically saying you're going to borrow, but he utilizes language that lawyers speak in. Dave. The, the board. Dave, I, is, yep. I think that this meeting has gone on long enough and we ought to say, Five more minutes of discussion and then they move on from the intersection. Okay. We're going round and round. Uh, it's not going to do a lot of good. I think we've got a lot of stuff to think about. It's been a very good discussion um, and there's a lot. Uh, we can't absorb much more. So I'm going to make that kind of a ruling those five more minutes and we're going to move on. Okay. And is that five more minutes going to include the discussion of the proposal regarding information collection and dissemination? Sure, if you bring it up, it is. I, I would like to spend at least a couple minutes on that. 
to see if the board is interested in pursuing that option. Hi, this is Mary. I want to um, just uh, add my agreement to the people who have expressed uh, their concern that the wording, wording of the uh, warning is confusing. And it's confusing to me. I would have to read it again two or three times before I voted on it. I And I, I question that it's uh, written in stone and, and can't be flipped around. I but uh, you said, Dave, that um, the lawyer is wedded to that I, language. No, I don't think I said he's wedded. I, I, I basically said that, um, and I haven't gotten down to uh, Sarah's <coughs> remark on flipping it. Um, yeah. you know, I think that something as basic as that might be possible. Okay. Um, I think I agreed with you know the possibility of Matt Dunn saying stick the, the grant money in there. However, the difficulty with that is, is that we are perhaps anticipating some that we don't have yet and won't know that until after the vote. Right. So right. it's essentially left as, you know, anticipating more grant money, um, you know, there. So um, I can certainly speak with Paul and, you know, express some of the concerns mm -hmm. and see if we can simplify that. Um, and and I'll have a little bit more of an answer for you next meeting. Or Thank, you, Dave. Thank you. Yep. This is Sarah. Um, I would absolutely agree with Mary, what Mary has said. I think it is very important that the statement be correct legally so we don't run into problems. However, the people who are going to read this are not lawyers. And I agree that you should start with the total estimated cost and explain that is reduced by funds that have been awarded and possibly if you choose to that another 68,000 whatever it is pending and therefore we are asking the town to vote as to whether or not to borrow the 961,000 and end uh, no whatever it is the 1061 uh, whatever that lower number is end on the lower number I'm sure that can be done legally. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Chuck Benson, one more final question. Just getting back to what Curtis uh, brought up about having objective data. And I'm wondering, the spreadsheets that you showed, which were difficult to see because the screen wasn't large enough, could you make those spreadsheets available like as a PDF for those of us who are citizens so that we can go over that data and help us to understand um, the both history and how we got to where we're at. I uh, yeah, I mean I guess I yes, the answer is, you know, it's a public document. Um, it was shown at um, you know a, a meeting. Um, you know, I just would make sure that everybody knows, you know, that particular spreadsheet I put in, you know, the 15 percent that I've got in there, et cetera. But um, I, anybody who would request it would sure. Can I can I go ahead and use that yeah, as a segue? <laughs> yes, yeah, so Phil, excuse me, Curtis, um, I think we need to end the discussion on um, the intersection and take a few minutes for your ideas of how to uh, answer questions better and get the information out. So go ahead, try to keep Keep it short. Yeah, I think it's really simple. Um, there are a lot of people who have questions. They've asked it on the listserv to select people individually to Dave directly, either the phone through email. Um, we've dealt with a lot of redundant questions and a lot of misinformation. And I think we could do save everyone time and mental anguish by establishing a centralized forum whereby people can submit questions and concerns regarding both the bearing of the utilities and the underlying project. That centralized forum could have all of the questions and concerns collated and duplicates removed. And then the people in the town who have that information could provide it and that could then be released again to a centralized location. So uh, I ran this proposal by Dave he suggested that I make a couple changes about timing. 
which I did, and then I sent it to the members of the select board today. In effect, what this proposal would do is establish a dedicated email address and phone number for people to send or submit their questions and concerns regarding the project, both underlying and utilities at Three Corners. Uh, this phone number wouldn't be answered on a regular basis. Instead, it would just be set up to take messages. Someone, that someone being me, I'll volunteer it right now at the very beginning, unless someone else wants it, they can take it. Um, but someone would then read through all of the emails um, and all of, listen, well, you don't have to, if it's a Google Voice number, you don't actually have to listen to all of the messages because they get delivered in text anyway. And so then you can just read them and categorize them that way. Organize the questions um, thematically and um, really remove any duplicates. And then this, uh, the list of questions, or I, I would anticipate that the email address and phone number could, would be set up this week and could be notified through the listserv um, and office or notices at both, both post offices and mics. So that would be the end of this week. That email address and phone number would stay active until two weeks before the public hearing. Um, and what day do you anticipate for that, uh, Dave? You told me. So. Um I believe that we can and it would make for convenience to have the public hearing at our August 3rd select board meeting. Okay, so we would have 14 days before that meeting. Um, those The number and email address would essentially uh, stop receiving new things. I would take one day to remove all duplicates, organize the questions and concerns, and submit them to Dave. Dave then would have five days um, to compile a response to those, the answers to those questions and responses to those concerns so that eight days before the public hearing, or so that seven days before the public hearing, um, a, either those responses themselves could be posted at both post offices and mics and sent on the listserv, or some way of accessing that centralized database with those answers and responses could be posted into those sites. So that's the whole thing. Phil, I think you're muted. Thank you. I just clicked the wrong at the wrong time. Uh, Curtis, I think this this is a good idea. Um, Thank you for offering to volunteer to do the collation and the sort of little bit of data scrubbing. Um, uh, the only thing I would add is I would hope people would identify themselves and we would keep that so that um, if Curtis and Phil ask this question, we know that we're responding, we're, we're responding to. Uh, I, I would have to sort of think, you know, Rely on rely on others as well as Dave to think about the timing, and um, and I think we can continue to brainstorm about distributing the results. I think it's a great idea, Curtis. And I'm glad you took this on, and I don't think anyone's going to take it away from you. <laughs> no, no. Um, as we know from experience with all kinds of um, issues in town. Getting information out is always the worst, worst or the hardest part. So uh, I'm quite impressed. Uh, I think that, that it might actually work. So thank you, Curtis, for putting a lot of uh, a lot of thought into it. Right, and Gordon, uh, the work that uh, Kira and Curtis had done with the mutual aid um, have had had the same foundation. Yes, so, that, uh, that's we, right. Of a track worker. Yeah, you know, that's, that's, that's right, I remember. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm going to say we're done with the intersection for tonight. We're definitely so I'm going to take that as a, I'm going to start working on it. <laughs> I, I don't hear any, anything negative. Awesome. Cool.
Um, and so that leaves us with manager's notes. I think we probably covered most of them, but do you have any more things to say, Dave? No, I think we pretty well covered it all somewhere <laughs> throughout the meeting. Yeah, I thought so. I want to ask one question regarding manager's notes and the um, delinquent delinquencies. Um, these four properties with the cumulative delinquency, are those sort of repeat offenders or new customers? Um, one is new and he himself totals close to 50 grand. The others, I think, is probably more than 25 combined. Um, the other three have been two or kind of new last year. This is their second year on it. And the fourth one has been a repeat. So if I'm reading this correctly, if I'm reading between the lines on this and maybe I'm over reading it, it seems like your you're thinking that those are the properties that are the highest targets for a delinquent tax sale or so the, the um they all four of those would go to tax sale um you know the the one that's new just this year in in february just due to the amount um you know we don't want that to go you know much longer you know you go two years and it's 100 grand so um there is some, you know, definite concern with that one, um, and he would go, and um, you know, the other three are on there and would go just due to, you know, the fact that it's time, um, you know, so those four would be on there. Yes. Curtis, uh, we have a, a history <clears throat> in in town of being fairly lenient with delinquent taxpayers, and we've kind of, I think we've concluded that we're not doing anybody a service or, or a favor by doing that. It's getting, it's allowing them to get themselves into much worse difficulties. So this, it's a good thing to okay. uh, move on these things. <clears throat> um, uh, Dave, you included some correspondence about uh, radar and automatic ticket generating radar stations. Um, I've been a fan of the simple radar. I know we tried to reach out to the, our local VTrans unit and they did not have one, uh, one for us to borrow. Um, are you expecting any action from us tonight on that or is it just an informational piece? Uh, so you've kind of jumped uh, to correspondence. Uh, um, so um, just trying to get the meeting moving along here. <laughs> So for conversation purposes, that came in from Theo Ambrose, um, and I'm a little confused. So the original conversation, uh, just the the things that you see, like the sheriff set up, was not what he was proposing. Um, he was proposing one that more like uh, if you're on uh, 80, um, 93 going down to Boston, and you go through, you, you could have the choice of paying your toll or you zip through and electronically pay. If you zip through and you haven't paid, you know, there's a, there's a, or you're doing something wrong, there's a, there's a little like camera that gets your license plate and somehow administers, you know, you would ticket. I'm not sure exactly how that happens. I asked that to Theo, but his intent was, was to have a unit that will get the person's, you know, essentially act as a law enforcement officer and, you know, would accumulate that data. So I asked him a few questions and he looked into it and in, and in the responses, in, in the correspondence to that email chain that you have, there's a, there's a conversation for him saying, yeah, that, you know, once he looked into the cost and, and all that stuff, he's like, yeah, this is just way too expensive. But then he, finishes by saying, well, if you lower five miles per hour, I will go in for half of it. I did respond and say half of which one are you talking about, which, you know, 
piece of machinery. I didn't get an answer really <clears throat> because my other conversation was, is, you know, a 25 mile per hour speed limit is generally reserved for school zones and villages. And I got kind of a lengthy response on how good it would be to go at 25 miles per hour. I didn't really get a response as to what he would be willing to pay for, um, you know, if we were to lower it to 25 miles per hour, but it is a, you do this and I'll give you that. And I'm not sure exactly what we get. And it's not even just as simple as lowering it to 25. He also asks to narrow the marked vehicle lane at nine feet to enable walkers, bicycles, and other foot traffic to have a shoulder. So it's actually a pretty, a pretty big stipulation there. Yeah, I think we would be lucky to lower it to 30. Um, we have to do a traffic study. It's somewhat expensive. Um, can't just, it's a state aid road. We can't just do what we want to do. <clears throat> I do think you need to do the study to change the, change the yeah. traffic. 35, 35 now to 25. Yeah, I'm, I'm, but you're right, Dave. I, you, don't see, you don't see 25 anywhere unless it's uh, in Windsor or Woodstock where the town is in control of the, of the, and pays the bills. I don't think we can do that. What about, this is John Bruno again. <clears throat> I know in Ludlow and a few other towns, <clears throat> as you approach the village, they just have a small, uh, a smaller type of post-mounted speed limit. Uh, I find, to be personally honest with you, I find those very helpful um, to reminding you to slow down. And it's not a ticketed thing, but it just is there to help you, to remind you to slow down. And I find it personally um, effective. And um, uh, John, that's what we asked to borrow from the state, not not this. We asked to borrow a portable one to move it around. Um, and I agree with you that the psychological effect of saying that, oh, you're in a 50 mile zone and you're going 60 or whatever your whatever your numbers are, are very effective. Um, so um, I, I would be hoping that maybe we could reach out to our local VTrans group and ask them if we can borrow their cart. And it is required that on that cart, beside the feedback, that you the speed limit be posted, which is a simple, hopefully, just signage. I'm not thinking of the portable ones that are like on wheels. No. I've actually you know, seen box. some that are right. know, maybe 18 inches by 12 inches or 18 by 18, and they're actually mounted on a on a post, and they're permanent. It's a permanent installation, not a sure. not a temporary one, but. Right. So according to my read of the email that Theo sent, that's the type of unit he's proposing going half in on um, and costs. He estimated the cost at thirty five hundred dollars as long as there exists already a pole from which to draw electricity. So thirty five hundred a pop times how many do we need? Well, that's if the pole with electricity already exists. They're, they're more expensive than that. I dealt with them. Norwich has them. When I was in Norwich, I dealt with them over there. So they're more, they're, you know, the, the mobile one's a little bit, but even then it's still more than 3,500. But the post one is more like 77 grand, 7,500. Um, I'm guessing with this era of uh, overbearing police that a uh, um, mechanical or electronic device uh, where a big brother is watching over you and sending you bills, it would not be very popular. And we certainly don't want to embrace the Bridgewater model of uh, how many tickets per day do they have? Yeah, to yeah. I, just, I just don't think that's a very good idea. Well, I think they just got rid of it too, didn't they? Yes. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. Or, or at least they're going to scale it way down. I do want to say I do want to say that I don't know I can't speak for Dave because he had to do the correspondence but reading the correspondence I do want to say thank you to Theo for like taking an active interest in it and at least trying to find some stuff out and and move the conversation along I think I've had several people in North Heartland suggest to me 
that one of those signs that just tells you what your speed is for the North Heartland Village would be great. And I, I agree that the village here is walked pretty regularly and people just blow through it, especially right in front of the church. And so there might be other areas around town where we could identify something like that, having a large and effective psychological effect as Phil says. So not for now, but now to stew on. <laughs> So do we have any other things? Anything well, else bring up? I will throw in my two cents that um, the Energy Committee has been trying to put together a request to uh, restripe lines, especially from four corners to three corners on the roads to allow a bit more of a lane for cyclists. Um, I, I don't know all the ins and outs of it, but um, but that's percolating through the Energy Committee at a pretty low priority, but it's there. Yeah, well, we'll have to find out what the rules are. It may, it may be like Theo says, a certain speed allows a narrower road, a narrower travel lane. Figure that out. Does anyone have anything else to bring up? I wanted to ask about those flags in North Heartland. Oh, good one, Martha. Given that we're not really doing much for the 4th of July this year, I think it would be a really nice time to have flags in North Heartland and maybe a couple in Four Corners. Ooh, I vote for Four Corners. Mary? I want some of my vote. I vote for North Heartland, too. <laughs> yeah, this is Helen. How much do those things actually cost to get them up and you know, make someone monitor and put the flags up and whatever, because nobody's ever really discussed that. And it can't seem that it's that much. You know, I think North Heartland feels like it's not really a part of us, so it would help. Uh, you know, Helen, I don't have any answer for you on the cost. Um, I was kind of waiting to hear a little more direction from the, the board on which way we wanted to go. Um, I don't think we, you know, I don't, I would recommend, not recommend, you know, we kind of, I think we used broomsticks originally. Um, I, I don't have a cost on it. I think the, it, the, the bigger problem is just dedicating the, the man hours to, you know, putting up however many, you know, we're going to put up in North Heartland and, and Four Corners. It, has, it hasn't been all that many years since we put them up in Three Corners. I think Bill Barrows might have an idea of what kind of job it is and maybe even how much flags cost. I don't know. Yeah. So we, Dave, uh, if Dave, I do correctly, just, oh, sorry, sorry. Can ahead. we just look into the cost, Dave? Yep. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. So that would be the monetary cost of the flags and the poles and also the man hour for installation initially and ongoing installation, Dave, or what would that include? I, I, like can't, that. I can't tell you that sometimes, you know, it's a day's work just putting them up, you know, before Memorial Day. How long it's going to take to actually mount them to each pole, I, you know, I can't say. Okay. It'll be, I'll, I'll get a general idea how long it took them to put up um, three corners. Don't the scouts do um, service projects anymore? Maybe they would be interested in doing it, whatever the highest level of the Boy Scouts is. There are always Eagle Scout projects. Um, whether that corresponds with the timing or not, um, this would be a good one. Um, yeah, I think so. Yep. Maybe the American Legion could help um, provide the flags. Woohoo! Good idea. Good. Yeah. They might get a discount on flags. <laughs> and maybe that would get us in the paper, too. <laughs> I like not being in the paper. Anything else? Thank you for doing all that extra um, uh, layout of the data and the numbers. It was very helpful. Super yes. helpful. 
Dave, that timeline was great. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Get a chance to catch up on a little sleep there, Mary? <laughs> Sorry. I plugged out there for a little bit, you know. I took a little break and then came back. It was uh it was all good, Dave. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And I guess a, a um two questions. One, uh, do you know what happened when you sort of disconnected yourself so that we can avoid it next time? And and um, and then and, and if it's a personal silly thing, don't answer it. And uh, since the Internet was out in most of town last week, does anyone really know why it was out? Yes, yeah, I thought something was cut. They cut a line on Lover's Lane and it, you know, like took off the whole half of, New, of uh, Heartland. It was one of the companies working on the trees, a tree thinning company that uh, filled uh, a tree on the line, according to detail. Uh, lots of different options, but no one knows for sure. I mean, severing, severing, it had to be a main trunk line. So that's, that was my, anyway, thank you. So would we have avoided it if the lines were buried? Mm. <laughs> the lines weren't buried deep enough. It's <laughs> all about how you bury them. Yeah, exactly. oh, that was it. Dave, so, you're, so um, Phil, thank you all so much. Phil, I hit an X at the top here. I meant to close out of a window, and I closed myself out of Teams completely. Gotcha. Uh, and, and you were able to get back in, or was that a, just a hassle or something? Well, after like five minutes of talking and getting a phone number and an email and a text, I realized that I was talking to no one. <laughs> so, oh my God. I had to then figure out like, okay, you know, I was a little hesitant, but I just re-entered Teams. And That's then I was afraid I would have, I lost you all. Right. But you were all still there. I just popped back in. Oh, we were about to leave. Just, it was really a virtual mirage, you know, kind of a... <laughs> Dave, the, Dave getting... the background, your background with the cabinets is way better than just the lights on the ceiling. Very professional, yes. very it's fancy. A, yeah. It's a good move. And, yes, Dave. And Dave, you also left the desktop up right now, so it's been. Um... Uh, it doesn't really work because I've got like papers and stuff on a box as a desk, <laughs> so I'm just kind of, you know, I'm kind of squeezed in like a two foot section here. Um, it's not all that comfortable. But Dave, um, has there been any any of the updates from the state that's going to increase the probability of us being able to see each other in person anytime in the future? So I did have somebody ask. Um, I something came out today. I know June fifteenth was going to be kind of a big. He, he's announced something. All I saw was he extended the emergency. Uh, I am expecting a um, to be able to meet 50 or under at some point, maybe in July. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, I think that the rules still apply. You're gonna have to take a temperature. You're gonna take. You know, you're gonna wear a mask. You gotta equally distance. Um, you know, write down who attended, which we need to do anyways. Um, you know, and then you've got 30 people in a room, and you know, ask yourself how smart that is. But um, at the end of the day, today, uh, we can't. But I am expecting, you know, people are out there eating lunch and all kinds of good stuff. Um, you know, I'm expecting at some point. But the, the guidance is still, if you can, you know, meet remotely, you should. And at the moment, it's still 25 or less. And if you're going to meet 25 or less, you got to do the certain protocols um, when you do it. So, you know, there's... No, that's that's the official guidance anyways. Okay. So are we done? That's all I got. Oh, uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, let's have a motion to, uh, to adjourn. I'll, I'll move to adjourn. I'll second the motion. Okay, thank you very much. It was a good meeting. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. It's good to see you. Stay good. safe. Thanks to all our guests and citizens. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye.
Hey, Bill. <laughs> hey, how'd you think it went? Yep. 